Hello, this is Matt from Matt Heaney Apps, and welcome to part five in our six part full game tutorial series teaching you how to make the full iPhone game solo mission in Xcode using SpriteKit and Swift. So far, we have a player in space that can fire bullets at enemies, we can kill enemies, and the enemies can kill us. We have a score system, a life system, and a level system. Today, we will set up game over, which will occur when an enemy kills you or when you run out of lives. When game over occurs, the whole game will freeze for a second and then we will move into another scene, which will show our score, our high score, and will let the player start the game again. So, by the end of this video, your game will look like this. So, let's jump into Xcode to continue. Okay, so back into Xcode and back into our game scene.swift. So today we're setting up our game over. So the first thing that we will do today is create a function which will hold all of the code that we want to run when we get game over. We can then simply call this function whenever we run game over. So let's find some room outside of another function and we will say func and we will call this run game over. So in here, so between these two curly brackets, we will have all of our code which will deal with running game over. All we have to do then is simply run, run game over, whenever we want game over to occur. So before we go about setting up what will happen when we get game over, we will tell Xcode when we want to run, run game over. So when do we want this game to end? Well in solo mission, there's two ways we can get game over. The first one is if the enemy ship crashes into the player ship. Both ships will explode and it's game over. The other possibility is if we run out of lives. So if a ship leaves the bottom of the screen without being hit by a bullet, we will lose a life. And if we hit zero lives, it's game over. So let's quickly set that up. So we will move into our did begin contact and we will find the if statement that says if the player has hit the enemy. So once we've spawned our explosions and we've deleted the two ships, we will simply run, run game over. So now if the player hits the enemy, deal with all of our explosion stuff from part three and then run the function to end the game. So that's the first one done. The other one is going to be in lose a life, which is dealing with our code to lose a life if an enemy ship passes the bottom of the screen without being hit by a bullet where we are saying, take one off of our lives, display that in our label, and then run the little bounce effect on the label so it catches your eye, so it's really obvious that you have lost a life. So what we're gonna do here is say if lives number equals equals zero. So if we've reached zero lives, then run game over. So now if we lose a life and we've run out of lives, run the function run game over. So our code now knows when we want to run game over. So when we are going to run the function run game over. So we can now set up what will actually happen when the game ends. So when game over occurs, there's a few things that we want to do. Basically, we want to change scene to a game over scene, which will show the words game over, show our score, show our high score, and give the player a chance to restart the game so they can play it again. But we don't want to move to this scene straight away. We want the game to entirely freeze for a second and then run game over. So as you can see here, this is the effect that we're after. We will get game over, the game will freeze, the bullets will stop, the enemies will stop, you can't move your ship, you can't fire bullets, and then after a second, we will fade into our brand new scene. So the first thing we have to do is stop everything. We have to stop the action to spawn enemies, we have to stop all of our bullets from moving, and we have to stop all of our enemies from moving. So the first thing we want to stop is our enemies spawning. As you may remember, we are saying every second or so, depending on which level we're on, spawn a brand new enemy and run this forever. Okay, so in start new level, we're saying spawn forever, so it's gonna repeat that spawn sequence forever. So we have to stop that. Otherwise in that second pause, we'll get enemies, which will look really weird. So for that one, all we have to do is take the scene, so self dot 
and we're gonna remove all actions. So stop the actions that are running on the scene. So that one's nice and easy. That has now stopped the sequence which is spawning our enemies. For our bullets and for our enemies, it's a little bit more tricky. So basically what we have to do is find a way to get access to bullet and to enemy, find every single current instance of bullet or enemy and make it stop doing whatever it's doing. So it stops moving and stops on the scene. But we can't just say, take bullet and remove all actions because it's not gonna know what bullet is. And that's because we've had to declare bullet within a function. So let's have one more quick look at this. Sorry for scrolling all over the place. We've had to declare bullet in this function. So we can't get direct access to bullet from another function. You might be thinking, let's just make this global so we can get access to it. Now in theory, that would work. We could get access to bullets that way, but because we want loads of bullets, not just one at a time, this has to be declared within this function because then we will re-declare it every time we want to spawn a new bullet. If we had it globally, it would only ever be declared once. And if we asked for two of them, the game would crash. So we have to get access to this without making it global. And to do that, what we're gonna do is give bullet and enemy a reference name. We will then generate a list of all the objects currently on the scene with this reference name and then work our way through that list, stopping the actions on everything on that list. So we will generate a list of all the bullets and then say, take all the bullets on this list and make them all stop moving. Okay, that makes sense as we go. It's nowhere near as complicated as it sounds, I promise. So what we will do when we're setting up our bullet, we will say bullet dot name equals, and we can now give this a name and we will give this a name of bullet with a capital B, just so you can kind of tell it's different from this name here. Okay, so this is a reference name, not the actual name of the object. Okay, so bullet now has a reference name. So now in game over, we'll get rid of that. We are going to generate our list of all the objects with this reference name. So we will say self, and we're gonna say enumerate enumerate child nodes with name, open bracket, and between the quotation marks, we will say bullet with a capital B. Open curly bracket and drop a line. So this here is very, very, very important because this here has to match this name here because this is what we're working with. Make sure both have the same capital B or any capitals that you have used. Okay, so this has now generated us a list of all the objects with the reference name bullet. We can now work our way through this list, stopping all of the bullets from doing anything. So the first thing we'll do is cycle through this list. So we'll say bullet, comma, stop, space, in, to loop round for everything on this list. And now each object on this list in turn is called bullet. So if we now affect bullet, we're affecting the objects on this list, running through this list and affecting one at a time. So we can now say bullet, this from here, dot remove all actions. Okay, so this will now stop everything on all of the bullets. We said when we spawn a bullet, spawn it with a reference name, a name, a reference name, whatever you want to call it, of bullet with a capital B. And we then said, generate us a list of all the objects currently on the scene with this name. So kind of behind the scenes, it is literally just a list of all the bullets that we currently have on the scene. We then said cycle through this list, calling each bullet. So go to the first one on the list, call it bullet, and affect that by taking away all of its actions. It will then go to the second bullet on the list, remove all of its actions, third one, remove all of its actions, and so on until all of the bullets have now stopped. Okay, so generate the list, cycled through, stopped all of the bullets. We'll now do something very similar for the enemy. So all we have to do is take enemy, give it a name, enemy. This is in spawn enemy. And then once again, in game over, make sure you're after the closing curly bracket for your first enumerate child nodes with name. 
we will do something very similar. Enumerate child nodes with name of enemy. So generate us our list, and then we will cycle around calling each enemy. This hasn't got to be enemy. This hasn't got to match this. This could be object, could be anything. But if we call it enemy, I hope it'll be a little bit more clear what we're actually doing. So we now take enemy and we will remove all actions. We have now generated a list of all of our bullets and all of our enemies and told each instance of a bullet or an enemy to stop. Okay, so now when we run out of lives or when our player ship crashes, bullets and enemies will all stop. So let's hit run and let's check that out. So in the game, if we play the game, try to avoid hitting the enemies, lose some lives. And as soon as we hit zero lives, the enemies stop, the bullets stop, and the enemies stop spawning. However, at the moment, we can still move our ship and we can still fire bullets. And these bullets still work because only bullets that were on the scene when the game ended had their actions removed. So anything new at the moment will just fire like normal. Which is why just after game over, it looks like a bullet was still firing. And that's because that bullet was fired just after game over had triggered. So we've now made the enemy stop, made the bullet stop, and we've stopped spawning enemies. But we don't really want to be moving our ship and firing bullets at this stage. Because in that second pause before moving into the game over scene, we can just take out more enemies which is obviously not what we want. So we now want to say when the game is finished, don't let the player move the player ship or fire any more bullets, which will then in effect also freeze the player, freezing the entire scene for a second. So let's jump back into Xcode to set that up. Okay, so back into Xcode. So we now want to stop the player ship from firing bullets or moving at the end of the game. We do, however, obviously want the player to be able to do this during the game. So for this, we will set up a simple state machine, which is going to be a way of telling our code what current state our game is in. Are we in the game or are we after the game? In video six, we'll be adding another game state, which is before the game. Okay, so when we have a proper start of our game where you have to tap the screen in the game scene to start the game, we will have three states before the game, during the game, and after the game. With this, we can make certain things only happen at certain times. For example, with this, we can easily say, only let the player fire bullets during the game. So globally, what we could do is say var current game state. And what we could do is have, for example, numbers here. We could have zero for before the game, one for during the game and two for after the game. But that could get really confusing really quick because we have to remember when current game state is zero, we're before the game. When it's one, we're during the game. And if it's two, it's after the game. Because imagine if we put this project aside for a week or two and come back. And we might kind of think maybe before the game's one, during the game is two and after the game is three. So that's a potential problem. So we don't really want to do that. We could use strings to say, you know, before the game or during the game, do certain things and then say, if current game state is during, let us fire bullets or let us move the ship. But again, so many potential problems. What if we spell it wrong? What if we put a lowercase d? You know what I mean? So many problems. I mean, we could use booleans to say, like it is before game equals true or false, it is in game true or false. But what if we accidentally have two set to true? Our code would then think we're before the game and in the game, and that would just mess up our code. So what we're going to do is eliminate all of these problems by setting up a data type called an enumeration. We'll set this up and I will show you exactly how we use it and why this is so beneficial. We will say enum and we will call this game state. Open curly bracket drop a line. So in here, we will set up all of our possible game states by saying case. We're going to put pre-game in even though we haven't set up the start of the game yet, but we'll have this here now anyway. We want case in game, so during the game. So this first one is uh, when the game state is before the start of the game. 
This one is when the game state is during the game and case after game when the game state is after the game. So when this game has finished. So we now have set up three possible game states to tell our code if we're before the game, playing the game, so the game is currently active, or after the game. So when the game has finished, we're in that second long pause before we moved into our game over scene. So we're still on the game scene, but the game has finished. What we can now do is say var, making sure you're outside of your state machine enumeration. We say var current game state. And we can now set this to game state dot, because we haven't set up our start of the game yet, the starting value will be in game, because straight away the game begins. Okay, so now current game state is storing the state of our game. Are we currently before the game, in the game, or after the game? And it now knows to start with, it's currently in game, because that game starts straight away. Okay, and with this, we've now made it incredibly clear which one we're dealing with. It's not a zero, one, or two, and we can't make any typing errors here. Because we did misspell it, it would kick off and say, what's in GAM? So we have to spell it right. It's very clear, we can't spell it wrong, we can't accidentally tell our code that we're pre-game and in-game because this can only ever be set to one thing at a time. So that has now eliminated all of our problems with a simple state machine. Okay, so now to start with, it knows that we're starting straight in-game. In part six, this will change a little bit, but for now, we're starting straight in-game. With this, what we can now do is in our game over function, so run game over, straight away, we will now tell our code that the game state is now after the game. So current game state equals game state dot after game. So our code now knows that when we run game over, the game has finished. Just a quick heads up, once you've set this up and used it once before, you can just say dot after game. But we will keep the game state there, try and make it a little bit more clear to you what we're doing if you're getting a little bit confused. So we now have told our game if we're playing the game or if we've reached game over. So we now have to use this to actually do something. So we're gonna use this to only let the player move the ship and fire bullets during the game. When game over occurs, do not let the player fire bullets or move the ship. Because remember, we're having that second pause before we change scene. So the game will freeze before we change scene. So with this, we will move into our touches moved, where we are dealing with moving the ship when we drag our finger around the screen. And we want to find this line just here. The line that actually deals with moving the player's X position. And we're gonna throw this into an if statement. So if current game state equals equals game state dot in game, then actually do this. So now only do the following if current game state is set to in game. So only do this and only move the player if the game is currently active. So game over has not yet occurred because when game over occurs, current game state will change to after game. So therefore it will not equal in game Therefore, this will not happen. We're also moving to our touches began, where we're saying if we touch the screen, fire a bullet. Again, we're gonna say only fire a bullet if current game state equals equals game state dot in game. So now if we touch the screen, only fire a bullet if the game is active. Because once again, when game over occurs, we're changing current game state to after game to tell our code the game has now finished. So if game over has run and we try to fire a bullet, current game states will not equal in game, so therefore do not fire a bullet. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So using our game state, we've now told our code what the current state of the game is. Are we before the game, which we will set up in part six? Are we in the game or are we after the game and game over has occurred. So now only fire a bullet and only move the player ship if we're currently in the game. 
Now with that, there's just one more quick thing that I want to do, and it's to do with our enemy spawning. So in spawn enemy, we want to find the line where the enemy runs the action to move. Now this is a very, very rare thing to happen. I think it happened, I think once when I was testing this, and I tested it about a hundred times. What can happen is if the timing is very, very unlucky and the enemy spawns just as we're changing game state, everything is gonna freeze apart from the brand new enemy which will still move and it looks really weird. So for a little bit of safety, we will find the enemy.run action line and we're also gonna throw this into an if statement. So then if this does occur and the enemy spawned, it will spawn off the top of the screen. It won't move at all, so you won't be able to see it. And if this very rare bug does happen, you'll literally have no idea. So just for a bit of safety, we are gonna say only that our enemy move if current game state is set to in-game, okay? Just for a bit of safety, where if it does go wrong, just keep it off the screen, it's gonna do us no harm and you're never going to notice. So just for a bit of safety. So now when game over runs, we're changing our game state into after game and therefore we can't fire bullets and we can't move. So now the entire scene is going to freeze. So let's check it out, hit run. So in our game, if we now get game over, I'll let a few enemies pass. All the bullets are gonna stop all the enemies will stop and we can now no longer fire bullets or move our ship around the screen. So the game has now completely frozen. So we've now manually stopped all of the objects on the scene. However, at the moment, it sort of just stays like this and it will always stay like this until we close the game and move back into it, which is obviously not what we want. So what we're now gonna do is set up a brand new scene which will show the words game over show our score, show our high score, and let the player restart the game. We will then keep our game in this frozen state for a second before changing scene. So let's jump back into Xcode to continue. Okay, so back into Xcode, and we will now deal with changing scene to our game over scene. So before we can move to this scene, we actually have to make the scene. So what we're gonna do in Xcode, we will go to File, New, File, and to make a new scene, we will go to iOS source, Swift file, hit next. And here we will now name our new file. Now quick note, this is not the name of the new scene. This is just the new file name. So we're gonna call this game over scene. And now over on the left, you will see game over scene dot Swift. And it will look like this, incredibly empty. At the moment, it is just a blank file, doesn't do anything. Before we can do anything with it, we have to turn it into a scene. We will import SpriteKit, so we can now use scenes and actions and nodes and all the cool stuff that SpriteKit has to offer. And to make this into a scene, we will say class, we will name our scene. So this here is the name of our scene, and it's gonna be an SK scene. So we now have a brand new scene, called Game Over Scene. So we will come back to this in a little while and we will make our Game Over Scene. But to start with, we will deal with moving to our Game Over Scene once the game has ended and after the game has frozen for a second. So back into our game scene dot Swift. And the first thing we will do is just after our Game Over function, we will make a brand new function called Change Scene. And this here is gonna store all of our code to change from this scene, the game scene, into our brand new scene, the game over scene. So let's begin with that. So the first thing that we have to do is declare something new to hold all the information about which scene we want to move to and how we want to set this scene up. So in here we will say let, and we will call this scene to move to. And to start with, we have to say which scene we want to move to. So we want to move to the game over scene, and we have to pass it a size, which is the same as the current scene's size. So when we move to our new scene, move to the game over scene, and make that scene the same size as this scene's size. Just so we don't get any nasty surprises. The scene won't be too big, too small, because if it is, it'll look really weird. Same sort of deal with the scale mode. So we're gonna say scene to move to, 
dot scale mode equals self dot scale mode. So set the scale mode of our brand new scene to be the same scale mode as the current scene. So it's not too stretched, it's not too squished, the aspect ratio won't be different because without this line here, we're running the risk that our new scene will be presented looking differently to how we want it. So if we carry across the same size and the same scale mode, the scene will be set up in the exact same way so we won't get any nasty surprises. We want a transition when we move to the scene. So let transition be an SK transition dot and we will keep it nice and simple with fade with duration across 0.5 seconds. Tidy this up a little bit, there we go. So we've now said what scene we want to move to and it has a size and a scale mode and we have created a transition. All we have to do now is use all this information to move to a new scene with our transition. So we will say self.view scene. We want to move to scene to move to, which is our game over scene with the size and scale mode. With the transition of this transit, I'll tell you what we do, we change that one to my transition, just so it's a little bit clearer down here. So transition will be my transition, okay? Otherwise we'll say transition, transition. And if you guys are looking back on this in a couple of weeks, that might be a little bit confusing. So let's keep it nice and simple. So we're now saying take the view that's currently showing this scene, get rid of this scene and present the new scene, scene to move to, which is our game over scene with our set size and set scale mode with the transition, my transition. So it will fade with duration across half a second. So now when we run this, our game scene will fade into our game over scene across half a second. So that's the code to change scene. All we have to do now is tell this when to run. Now remember, we want this to run when game over has occurred and after a second pause. So into the function run game over, we will set up some actions. We will say let change scene action, gonna equal an SK action, and this action will be to run the block change scene. So this from down here, change scene. So this action will run the function change scene, which we just made, which will change scene into the game over scene. We then want a wait, to change scene, which is gonna be an SK action dot wait for duration of one second. And we want a sequence. So change scene sequence, be an SK action dot sequence. So a list of actions, an array of actions that's gonna run one after the other. And we are going to wait to change scene and then run a change scene action. And then we just run this on the scene. So self.run action, change scene sequence. So this one just here. So now what's gonna happen is we're going to run game over. We're gonna change our game state. We're gonna stop everything from doing everything. We then wait for a second and then change the scene. Okay, so game will end. Everything will freeze. We will wait for a second and then move into our game over scene by running the function change scene. Okay, so let's check that out. So if we now get game over, crash out, the game will freeze, wait for a second and then change scene. So at the moment we're just getting a black screen and that's because our game scene doesn't have anything in it yet. But the important thing is the game has now changed into this new scene. And this here in just a few moments will be our game over scene. Okay, so the important thing is game over, the game will end, wait for a second and change scene. So let's set up our game over scene so it's not just a black screen. Okay, so back into Xcode and let's jump into our game over scene dot Swift and let's make our actual game over scene so it's not just a black screen. So this scene here is completely separate from the game scene. So for the game over scene, we need a brand new did move to view. And just like in the game scene, any code between these two curly brackets is going to run as soon as we move into the game over scene. So we're gonna create our game over scene here. So what do we need? This is what the game over scene will look like. We need a background. We need a game over label. We need a label to show our score, a label to show our high score, and a label that will say restart, which will work as a button, which will take us back into the game scene. So one step at a time, let's start with our background. So all we have to do is make a brand new sprite node called background, SK sprite node, using the image background. So our starry sky background. 
So background, we will position this in the center of the scene. So this is all pretty much the exact same as what we did when we set up the background in the game scene. Don't copy and paste it across though. It's always good, especially when you're starting out, to type code, just get used to typing it. To get half of the width or half of the height, we can either divide by two or times it by 0.05. It's the exact same thing. Z position of zero, and then we can just add it to the scene. We need a game over label, which would be an SK label node, which uses the font, the bold font, the custom font. Its text will say game over. It will have a font size of 200. It will have a font color of white. We will give it a position of halfway across the scene and 70% of the way up the scene. We will give it a Z position of one to do with our layering and then we can just add our game over label. So our game over scene now has our background and a label that will say in nice big letters, game over. So the next thing on our to-do list for the game over scene is our score label, a label that will show our final score. So this will be another label that we will simply call score label. It's going to be an SK label node, which we use the font, the bold font. Now for this, we want the text to show our final score by saying score colon and then showing our actual score. So we want to gain access to game score from the game scene. However, at the moment, we can't just gain straight access to this because it is in a different scene. So if we try to do this, it's gonna kick off because it won't know what game score is. So what we have to do in the game scene is take our variable game score and change it from being global in the scene to being public to every scene. So if we declare it outside of the game scene, we can now gain access to it in all other scenes. So now in the game over scene, we can show game score in our label. One more quick thing to do, because we have now declared this outside of the scene, it won't be redeclared every time we move into the game scene. It will only be declared once. So that means it's only ever been set to zero once. So what we have to do in the did move to view in the game scene is set this back to zero. Otherwise our score will carry over because it's never being redeclared, therefore it's never being reinitialized, therefore that score will carry over. So now it's setting it back to zero every time we move into the game scene. So game over scene. We now have our score in our label. Our score label will have a font size of 125. It will have a font color of white, just to keep it all consistent. It will have a position of halfway across the scene and 55% of the way up, a Z position of one, and then we can simply add it. So we now have a label on our game over scene, which will show our final score. Next up is our high score. Now before we can do this, we actually have to figure out what the player's high score is. There's a couple of stages for this. We have to load up the current high score. We have to check to see if we've set a new high score. And if we have set a new high score, we have to save the new high score. Okay, then once we've done all of that, we can then display the high score in a label. So one step at a time. To gain access to information that we've saved in our app, we will use the NS user defaults, which will store information even after the app has been closed. And it will stay there until the app has been deleted off the user's phone. So to gain access to this, we will say let defaults, it's gonna equal our NS user defaults. So we can now gain access to our user defaults by using defaults. So we can now gain access to any information we've saved and we can save information. So we want a variable called high score number. It's a variable because this might change and it will equal defaults. So something from our NS user defaults and it's gonna be an integer, so a full number that we have saved as high score saved. So now whatever we have saved, in the user defaults as high score saved, 
will be loaded and the value of that will be set to high score number. So now high score number will be set to whatever the high score is. If this is the very first time we have played this and we've never set a high score, it will just load zero because nothing there. Okay, so we have our current high score. We now have to check to see if we've set a new high score. So if game score is greater than high score number, Okay, so if our score is higher than our high score, then we've set a new high score. So we will update the value of high score number to match game score, and we have to save our new high score. So we will jump back into our defaults, our NS user defaults, where we save information, and we are going to set an integer, and that integer will be high score number, and we will save this as high score saved. Make sure this here is exactly the same as this here. Okay, otherwise we'll be saving our high score in one place, trying to load it from another place so it won't work. It will always load zero because it'll be looking somewhere where nothing's ever been saved. So let's quickly break this down again. We are jumping into our NS user defaults, an area of our app that will save information even once the game has been closed and it will stay there until the game has been uninstalled. And we are loading information from high score saved. It'll be a full number, and we're setting this to high score number. So now high score number is going to equal whatever high score we have saved. We then said take that high score, and if game score, so our score of the game we have just finished, if that score is higher than our high score, therefore we've set a new high score, so update the value of high score number, so it's our brand new high score, and then save this as high score saved. So next time when we load our high score, it will load up our new high score, okay? We now show this in a label. So let high score label, it's gonna be an SK label node using the font, the bold font. It's text will say high score and it will show high score number. It will have a font size of 125, a font color of white, a Z position of one, an actual position of halfway across the scene and 45% of the way up, and then simply add it. So we now have a high score system in place and a label that will show our high score. So our game over scene is now taking shape. We have a background, we have a label that says game over, a label that will show our final score, and we have a label to show our high score. All we need now is a label that will work as a button to let the gamer move back into the game so they can play it again. So one more label, we will call this the restart label. So even though this will be a button, it's exactly the same as a normal label. It's gonna be an SK label node with the font named, yep, you guessed it, the bold font is text. We'll say restart, font size of 90, font color of white, SK color dot white color, a Z position of one, and an actual position of halfway across the screen and 30% of the way up. And then add our restart label. So our game over scene is now fully created and it looks exactly as we want it to look. So before we actually make our restart label into a button, let's check this out. Hit run. So if we get game over, let's get an actual score. And get game over, so my score is two. And after that second delay, we are taken into our game over scene, which looks a lot prettier than that black screen. We have our starry background. We have the words game over. It shows our score and it shows our high score. We also have our restart button, but it doesn't do anything yet. So to finish our game over, let's make our restart button work. So to make this into a button, what we have to do is when we touch the screen, figure out where in the scene we have pushed, and then we're gonna say, if that point matches the location of our restart label, then we must have pushed it. So it's just a label which will work as a button. So let's do that one step at a time. What we're gonna do is we will set up our touches began function. And this is going to run whenever we touch the screen. So the first thing we have to do is take this here, this touches, 
which is storing all of the information about our touch. And we have to break that down. So we're gonna say for touch, any object in touches, open curly, drop a line. And now in here, we can use touch to get all the information about how we touched and most importantly, where we touched on the screen or in the scene. So let's take touch and let's find out where we touched the screen. So we will say let, and we will call this point of touch. This is going to equal touch from up here. Touch dot location in node of self. So where did we touch in the object that is the scene? Where did we touch in the scene? So take the coordinates of where we touched and set this to point of touch. So now point of touch is a CG point storing the X and the Y coordinates of where we touched in the scene. We can now take this and compare this position to the position of the restart label. There's a couple of ways we can do this. We can do it through a reference name, but we did that in our last full game series. So I think this time we're gonna be more direct about it. But what we will do in video six, when we set up our main menu, we do it the other way. So you can see both ways. Okay, so for this way, what we're gonna do is take where we declared our restart label, copy it and make it global. So make sure it's still within the game over scene. So we can now set it up in our did move to view, but we can now gain straight access to it in touches began. So we're gonna figure out if the location we touched matches the location of that label. So if restart label dot contains point of where we touched, so point of touch. So is restart label in the same position as where we touched? Okay, so this here now turns that label into a button. And if we have pushed this label, we want to jump back into our game scene. So let scene to move to, this time it will be the game scene and the size will be the same as this scene size. The scale mode again will be the same scale mode as this scene's scale mode. Just like earlier on, to make sure we don't get any nasty surprises, we want a transition, SK transition. It's going to be phased with duration to keep it consistent across the game and then simply present it. So self.view.present scene, scene to move to, which is now our game scene with our size and our scale mode. And we will get there with our transition called my transition. So let's quickly break that down. We're saying when we touch the screen, take touches that were being passed as a set. So a collection of touches and break that down so we can use this information and call it touch. We then said, take the information about touch and take the location of where we touched and set that information to point of touch. We then made our restart label global within the scene. And we then said, if that label's position is the same as where we touched. So if we touched anywhere on that label, do the following, which will then take us back into our game scene so we can start the game again. Okay, so our restart label now works as a button. And just with that, our game over scene and our entire game over process is now completed. So let's hit run and let's check it out. So here is our game so far. If we get some points before getting game over, that would do. So let's get six, get game over, taken into our game over scene. As you can see, our high score updates and now what we'll do, we push restart, we go back into the game, and this time we will get under whatever our high score is to make sure the high score doesn't update. Okay, so we get, we get one. So as you can see, our game over scene now shows our newest score of one, but our high score stays at six. And we can now restart the game and we can keep playing to try and beat that high score. So we now have game over in our game. And the only thing that's left in this project is to just polish everything off. So we're now very close to being finished. So in the next video, which is the last video in this series, we will do exactly that. We will polish off this game to make it as good as it can be. We will add a scrolling background. We will add back in audio. We will add a start sequence and we will add a main menu. But for this video, that is all. 
As always, thank you very much for watching. If you liked watching this video, which I really hope you did, hit that like button, hit subscribe, leave any feedback down in the comments, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.